Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. My name is Jen with Slope Garden Center. Welcome to our talk today on attracting native pollinators in the garden with Joan Pont of the California Native Plant Society. Really excited to have her today. Um, I just want to go over a bit of housekeeping while, while people are logging on. First of all, I do have a poll going. If you can pop over into the poll and fill out, uh, fill it out. Uh, we'd like to get some information before Joan does her presentation. Also, uh, if you do have a question, you can pop it into the Q&A portion. We might stop for some questions during the presentation, but we're gonna save most of the time for Q&A towards the end of the presentation. So I'll be sort of filtering through those and compiling them and whatnot to ask Joan at the end of the presentation. Um, I also, I wanna let, let you know or remind you that all of the webinar recordings are available the, the Tuesday following the webinar. So this should be up on our website on Tuesday, April 27th under the learn tab. There's a video portion that it's there. Um, and also you should have received a copy of the slide, a link to the copy of her slides, as well as links to the resource handouts in either the registration confirmation email that you received or the reminder email that you received about an hour ago. So look for those. Um, a reminder that next week we're having a eco-friendly pest and disease management class again with Suzanne Bontempo of Our Water, Our World. I looked at the date like three times. It's May next weekend. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So yeah, that's um, coming up. And then the week after that is Peppers with Dan Alexander, who is our veggie, veggie guy. Um, a little bit about Joan. Uh, Joan started gardening in Mill Valley in 1983 and soon after joined the California Native Plant Society. Since then, her gardening has evolved to tending her seven acre property in Petaluma, complete with olives, fruit trees, vineyard, vegetables, and sheep that she uses for wool. Um, her goal was to lower the carbon footprint with homegrown food and clothing. She's learned from classes and workshops through Schoen Farm and Fibershed, as well as from soil sci scientists and agronomists. I hope I said that right. Um, Joan is retired from a re rewarding internal medicine practice, and the internal medicine gave her a slight boost to learning some botanical Latin, which is kind of fun. And a side note and an additional sort of fun fact is that Joan is a dear friend of the owner of Slope Garden Center, Dave Strauss, and her and I met through Dave. And I think that's kind of fun and a little bit of a full circle moment that we're able to see this community and this connection. And Dave, if you're watching, hello. Um, and Joan has done several classes with us in person pre-COVID and they've been very popular and we're really happy to have her join us virtually. So let me do the results really quick of the poll and then she'll take over. Okay, one moment. Um, okay, let's see. Most people, the majority of people are coming from Contra Costa County, which Contra Costa represents every class that we have. It's always been the majority. Um, so that's great. And then most people have gardened with native plants a little bit before, so not, um, not a ton. And 27% have never gardened with uh, native plants, and so they're looking forward to it. And most people are interested in attracting butterflies with bee, bees as a close second. So that's really great. Thank you for that information. And Joan, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Okay, <clears throat> and welcome. So I view pollinator gardens as the best gardens because they're filled with flowers. Are you giving me the screen? 
And from flowers from the early fossil records, they evolved a long time ago, maybe a hundred million years ago. They started out just as slightly modified leaves and they have diverged to these crazy shapes that you can actually find today. These are actual pictures of real flowers. There are orchids that look like dancing ballerinas or flying egrets. And there's a pipe vine that looks chillingly like Darth Vader. So flowers, um, we find flowers attractive, but the flowers intended audience is not, is not us, it is insects. So when I see insects in my garden, I think, hooray, bird food. Birds may come to your uh, bird feeder and spill out all that millet so that your deck feels like it's covered with ball bearings. But what they're really after is this juicy steak. I mean, caterpillar, crunchy on the outside, juicy on the inside and a lot of calories for their um, youngsters in their nest. I also think hooray pollinators. Something has to carry the pollen from the anther to the uh, stigma. Insects also represent predators. So you can have your own Serengeti, you can have your herbivores like wildebeest and zebras and your top predators like lions and leopards, where in your garden you'll have aphids and caterpillars and then your top predators, lady beetles and praying mantises. And lastly, I think insects really help make the world go round. They pollinate 90% of, of flowering plant species they don't have to um, pollinate plant flowers that are wind pollinated, and they certainly don't pollinate ferns or conifers. Um, but that helps keep the earth clothed in healthy plants. Since plants make all food, they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, of which there happens to be plenty, water from the soil, sunlight, and make all the chemicals, all the food, all the cellulose, everything that we eat and everything that every other animal on the planet eats and everything that fungus eats too. So basically they help keep the, the earth clothed in a healthy blanket and make it livable. So you in your own garden can help stave off the insect apocalypse. So we can go to the grocery store year round and get groceries or go to the farmer's market and even if we're growing all our own food, which would be rather remarkable, we can still preserve it or store it. Whereas your resident hummingbird is gonna need nectar 12 months of the year to survive. And many insects um, derive a lot of their nutrition from pollen and nectar, not just leaves. So they need flowers present all year round. I'm in Sonoma County. We have a product called wine. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or imbibed, but wine grapes actually do not need a pollinator. They are wind pollinated. And that's why their flowers are so diminutive because they don't have to attract insects. But vineyard managers will plant insectary rows, probably for its beauty, but also to encourage um, predatory insects and birds. And it really has reduced their, um, their pest population. Um, oaks are also not pollinated by a pollinator, they're wind pollinated, but they are considered a keystone species supporting pollinators in the larval stage. Pollinators, uh, caterpillars are going to eat the leaves. So the whole point of any flower is sex. This is sexual reproduction rather than vegetative reproduction. As your strawberry plant is going to send out a runner and make a little offspring strawberry plant, but that's a clone. That's identical genetically to the parent plant. Whereas when you mix up the genes, just like us, we're different than our parents, no matter what the progressive ad says, our children are different from us, for which they are eternally grateful. So it is important to mix up these genes. And with limited motion, somebody has to get the pollen from this anther all the way to this stigma to get down the tube to make a new seed, which is genetically distinct. So insects pollinate, birds pollinate, bats pollinate. Um, there are plants that are pollinated by rats. Those flowers are low down on sturdy stems and smell awful. So I don't have any of those plants in my garden, but maybe one of you is interested in that. I don't know. So where do you find out about um, plants for your garden. Well, your own observation about 
where you live, your neighbors, and your open spaces around you. There's a wonderful book out last year called Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. He has a new book out this year on oaks, which he considers an important keystone species, which tells you the why of biodiversity. He's East Coast, but it's very generalizable. The West Coast book that I found really helpful is The California Native Landscape by Greg Rubin. He's in San Diego and they have a longer dry season and a longer fire season. So we can really learn a lot from his experience. Slope has a website, which is super helpful. CNPS, California Native Plant Society was started in the sixties for education and appreciation of native plants and is fabulous. There's two um, sites, which I basically keep on my computer all the time. I didn't at first realize how different they were, but I'll talk about them at the uh, references, calscape.org and calflora.org. If you see a plant uh, hiking or in a neighbor's house that you just love, you can find out what it is without being an expert taxonomist, um, which takes a long time to learn, and take a picture with iNaturalist or picture this. Picture this app is a product that cost $20 a year. iNaturalist is free and it's from the California Academy of Sciences and CNPS. I grew up with the Sunset Western Garden book and it's still a great resource. It's wonderful for edibles. Well, hi, Pup. So I decided that we should supply plants 12 months of the year. So my challenge was to make suggestions for plants in your garden uh, for every month of the year. And January, I deemed Manzanita month. So Manzanita is a specific species within the genus, which is a larger group called Arctostaphylus. And there's a lot of species within the Arctostaphylus group, but a lot of people call them all Manzanitas. Some are low ground covers, some are mounding shrubs, and some would even be trained up as a multi-stemmed small tree, which would be really appropriate for a smaller garden. So man Arctostaphylus Manzanita is the prototype and it is stunningly beautiful. There's a lot of manzanitas to choose from. So if you're gonna bloom in January, you're gonna hope for more rain than this January gave us. So you need to protect uh, the pollen in your flowers from getting washed away. So manzanitas and other plants that are gonna be blooming in January are generally gonna have closed flowers. So this bell shaped flower and be downward facing. So it can rain all at once and the pollen will be protected. So it was a nice design trick. In the same plant family as the manzanitas are say rhododendrons, which are gonna bloom in May and they can have flashy open flowers because they don't have to be protected from them. They don't need to form their own umbrella. So manzanitas have another engineering trick. In the winter, their leaves can be flat and gather as much sun as possible in a low light situation or in summer to stave off drought and stave off extra evaporation or transpiration, they hold their leaves vertically and the sun can come down on either side and it can have less solar radiation. So plants actually do move. They are credited with motion. They just happen to move 20,000 times slower than us, which probably means we won't see too many at the Tokyo Olympics. So any plant in the garden that has multiple benefits is gonna get my attention. So the manzanitas or the Arctostaphylus are evergreen. Um, the berries are edible um, by people, but mostly by birds. So they attract birds and they're the host plant of a lot of butterflies, which means the caterpillars can munch at the leaves. Very drought tolerant. Uh, their rounded form is going to suppress all the leaves underneath them. So I only have a couple thousand hours more of weeding to do, not forever. And their um, beautiful red shiny bark is really stunning. Uh, they generally like full sun and they can tolerate a steep south facing slope uh, where a lot of other plants just would not be able to cope with that challenging situation. What I call defensive landscaping Let's say you're at your kitchen sink, you're looking out your window and your neighbor parks a really, really ugly, no longer cute, rusted out VW bug right in your view. So you measure it and you go to slow and you get an Arctostaphylus that's gonna to grow to that height. 
Don't get one that's going to be much taller. It's not going to get there any sooner. And you're going to be constantly trimming it with those PG&E type crew cuts. So get the nice mounding size and block any ugly view that you need to get blocked. Now, if your neighbor swaps out the VW bug with an RV, then go ahead and get the full-sized Manzanita. If you're looking for something very bizarre, remember Darth Vader, we have our own California native pipe vine called Aristolochia californica or the Dutchman's pipe vine. So it is deciduous, it is a vine, it needs support, has beautiful heart-shaped fuzzy leaves in the summer. And in January and February has these very bizarre saxophone shaped flowers. So this plant is gonna support two different pollinators. One are the gnats that can fly in because gnats actually do the pollination of these flowers because they're the only thing small enough to come twisty turning and around and exit. Whereas in the summer, the leaves are the obligate food, meaning the only food of the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So swallowtail butterflies have these extra long appendages off their hind wings like the swallowtail birds. And um, you'll be supporting a native butterfly species with a beautiful vine. February, turn to Ceanothus. Common name is California lilac. So just like Arctostaphylus, Ceanothus is a genus with a lot of species within it. Also evergreen. Also you can choose from a woody ground cover to a smaller shrub, a VW size shrub to an RV hiding size shrub. Your color palette is blue, dark blue to purple, to medium blue, to light blue, all the way to white. But just like uh, Dutch China, your color choice is blue. People are probably familiar with beans in their garden being nitrogen fixers. They have nodules in their roots and within these nodules are bacterium called rhizobium that are synergistic and they can take atmospheric nitrogen, nitrogen in the air, and break that very sturdy bond and put it in a molecule that is accessible to the plant. So basically they're giving the plant fertilizer and the plant is giving them a place to live. So it turns out Cenothus also has nitrogen fixing nodules and their bacterium is a different bacterium, it's called Frankia. So in the wild, one can see Cenothus living for a hundred years in the garden, they tended to be shorter living, but maybe with more Frankia inoculation of the roots, we can get really, really long lasting Cenothus in our gardens as well. March, um, stone fruit make a stunning display in, in the spring. And here is an almond tree in uh, my very weedy orchard. So I'm making healthy soils with lots of live cover. And here's the almonds nearly four weeks later. I mean, I had no idea they switched over so quickly, but they all needed to get pollinated. Um, so all the apricots, almonds, peaches, plums, and hybrids have a beautiful flower display. Um, pears and apples and quinces also, they tend to flower more with the leaves, so they're not quite as pure flower, but still beautiful. But did you know that we have a native plum, a plum native to California. And it's called Prunus, that's the plum family, Prunus lissifolia. And the common name is holly leaf cherry. So it's an evergreen, it's not deciduous. It has these rather spiky shaped flowers, very small fruit, more on the size of cherries. And the edge of the leaf um, is more like a cat's tongue. It's, it's I mean, real hollies, those, um, that edge of that leaf can go through your finger. This one is a lot more pleasant, but it's a beautiful tree, um, large shrub to a small tree. Um, a lot of vineyard managers are using it as a windbreak. It's very sturdy. It is um, slow growing. Um, so you might be growing it more for your next generation uh, rather than this generation, but give it time and it will um, be very rewarding because it is considered a keystone species because it supports so many uh, different species of insects. April is always fun to go on a hike or go in your garden for wildflowers. 
So there's a couple different ways of getting wildflowers in your garden. And one is to clear out an area in October of those pesky European non-native grasses and spread out wildflower seeds. Um, I would rather get different packets and have a drift of one and a drift in the other rather than a complete mix, but you can do it either way. Alternatively and more sustainably is to have a meadow since lawns are out, obviously with the drought, meadows um, are in and um, have bunch grasses and that has open ground in between the bunch grass um, for wildflowers and actually for habitat for our native bees. Um, so some wildflowers, and then lastly, you can get four inch pots of um, flowers at the garden center in the spring and there's lots to choose from. And keep track of what's happiest in your garden and then lean to that. But poppies, gilia, gilia capitata is a beautiful blue, lupins, five spot, phacelias are gorgeous. They have that curly tops like the top of a, of a violin with the little flowers. Chinese houses, baby blue eyes, Clarkias, as in Lewis and Clark, Clarkias are wonderful, tidy tips. Lots of choices that are enticing. So I mentioned no lawn and choosing a bunch grass. This um, poster is actually from the um, Great Plains from the Midwest, but um, the lessons learned can be applied to, um, to our environment. So here is turf grasses with very, very short roots and requiring a lot of repeat water application. Whereas bunch grasses can have roots 20 feet into the ground. Yes, someone excavated down and found the roots extending 20 feet into the ground. Bunch grasses are credited with living up to 300 years. That's like an oak tree. And you see this little grass on the ground and you're like, oh, that's my heritage grass. Your heritage oak? No, no, my heritage bunch grass. And it leaves open ground for, um, for the native bees. There are about 300 species of uh, grasses native to California. And there are also, just coincidentally, 300 plus species of native bees. 70% of native bees are ground nesting and 30% drill holes in twigs, in hollow twigs and lay their eggs in a twig setting. The bees are solitary, so they don't make big colonies like honeybees from Europe. So unless you have a micro pipette and you're gonna steal the honey for one little solitary bee egg, you're not gonna collect any honey from them, but they're great pollinators. May is for monarchs. So actually the uh, milkweed flowers all through the summer. So beyond May. And I was always curious why the common name got to be milkweed because as you can see, these are totally good looking flowers on a very good looking plant. But it turns out that uh, the Europeans that first came to North America, um, the first Europeans to come to North America, not the first people, obviously, because people have been here a long time. Uh, they were seeing plants that they had never seen before um, and they just called them weeds, which to me is a little ironic because now when I see a European non-native plant in my garden, I consider it a weed. So we have 17 members of Asclepius in California and the two that I find most common in our garden centers are Asclepius fascicularis and Asclepius speciosa. The narrow leaf milkweed, that's the one I'm growing. And this picture is the showy milkweed, which is really good looking plant. So the butterflies, the pregnant female butterfly actually has chemoreceptors in her feet so we have chemoreceptors on our tongue. We can tell with our eyes closed an apricot from a peach. We can tell these differences because we've got chemoreceptors. She's got chemoreceptors in her feet and she's gonna paw around and find a milkweed plant as the only plant that she is gonna lay her eggs on. So she lays an egg, it has a little glue and it's attached to the leaf. So when it hatches, that little tiny caterpillar instantly has breakfast, lunch, and dinner to start um, eating. And it grows through five instars until it pupates, forms a chrysalis, and then emerges at a butterfly. 
So the milkweed doesn't want to get completely consumed. So it holds up a little bit of defense. It's got a bunch of chemicals in it that make the monarch butterfly totally distasteful to birds, thank goodness. But it also has latex, which can glue shut mouth parts, which I haven't seen on any Noom ads, but maybe it's their next, um, next method. Um, so this caterpillar will crawl up to the base of the leaf and chew through the midrib and stop the flow of latex and then go to the opposite end and start eating. And you can see on this raw edge, there's no latex easy, oozing out. So the leaf flags, it's lost its mass, so to speak. So if you just look at your milkweed patch and you see flag leaves, you think, hooray, there's some uh, caterpillars there. Um, the milkweed organization or the monarch um, organizations because of the catastrophic decline in monarch butterfly population advises that we not plant uh, tropical milkweeds uh, or if we do we cut them down to the ground in November because they can overwinter a parasite. June is for buckeyes. So I've decided that California is the buckeye state not Ohio. Buckeyes were a staple food for, for our indigenous uh, Miwok population, along with acorns. I think acorns tasted better. They do need to get um, processed before eating. But they're a beautiful domed tree um, with covered with flowers that smell wonderful in June. And if you don't have a big enough area for a tree, you can actually keep one bonsai um, in a container on your deck. They are drought deciduous, not winter deciduous. So they have the same number of months of leaf cover, but they're gonna drop their leaves in August after months and months of no rain and a lot of sun and green up in January. Uh, whereas other trees are just leafing out now. So in the fall, you get to see the seed, which gives you the term buck eye. And what I do is I wait for that first really windy storm and all these buckeyes fall to the ground. You can just pick them off the ground. You don't need to climb up a 20 foot tree to find them and plant them because I just love buckeyes. Buckeye flowers um, can interfere with larval formation of the European honeybees. So the apiarias that are um, making honey might want to uh, choose another tree than a buckeye, um, but save for our 300 species of native bees. And I got that reference from UCANR, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, which has a lot of information about um, uh, pest control, uh, organic pest control. July, sunflowers. Now I rarely pick a flower because I, I feel a flower is a transition to a seed and a fruit. It's just a, a means to an end. Um, but I guess I did break my own rule and pick these sunflowers. But I haven't been the only person picking sunflowers since the indigenous populations of North and South and Central America have been fooling around breeding and domesticating the sunflower for 5,000 years. So obviously there's food as in sunflower seeds and you can grind them into oil. Uh, the Hopi can make a beautiful dye from the sunflower seeds, a purple dye and you can always have flowers. So speaking of flowers, plural, these every single dot here is an individual flower, botanically speaking. So these are ray flowers with a single petal shooting out from the center and the rest are disc flowers arranged in the famous Fibonacci spiral. So this is a composite or a pseudoanthium, which is a new term for me for false flower. So there's a complete bouquet in one flower. So I impulse buy lots of different varieties of sunflowers and um, keep the seeds and plant them next year. Uh, I really do like the Delta sunflower. Um, it's a native sunflower. You can see it in road ditches when you're driving up to Sacramento covered in flowers. But if I were a seed farmer, if I were growing seeds to sell and I would want the plant that grows out of the seed to look anything like the, the parent plant, I would have to grow different varieties of sunflowers a quarter of a mile apart. 
because that's how far things can get cross pollinated by all the insects in your garden. So um, seed farmers really have to separate their crops um, of all the crops that can possibly cross pollinate huge distances. August, really like the salvias. Um, so salvias are in the mint family. There are lots of salvias native to California and they can be substituted for sage in your savory dishes. Um, members of the mint family are pretty straightforward to recognize because the stems are actually square. If you take one and roll your finger around a stem, you'll feel four edges. So square stem, opposite leaves, alternate leaves are more common, opposite leaves are less common. They smell minty with tubular flowers. And generally deer avoid them. So here we've got the Cleveland sage, which can be grown in a big drift. The hummingbird sage is unusual. It's got much larger leaves than the typical sage and can be successfully grown as an understory plant like under oaks. So they grow in shade, which is unusual for a salvia. And the white sage, which needs protection because people are over harvesting it in the wild for smudge sticks and whatnot. So uh, grow your own white sage and have people not pick it from the wild. And there's a hummingbird that actually matches the sage perfectly. But you can go beyond salvias within the same family to other mints. So those of you in San Francisco know the original name of San Francisco was Yerba Buena, and that's a plant. That is the, uh, a delicious mint that makes a wonderful tea. Coyote mint in the summer when there's no wind and the um, scent can loft, it can really add a wonderful area to your garden. And my favorite is the pitcher sage, Lepicinia fragrance. To me, the leaf, when you crush it, smells like minted grapefruit peel. It's a really stunning plant. It's about a three foot open shrub, not a dense shrub, sort of has an open habit. August is uh, add a buckwheat or two or 12 or 24 or 48. Um, this is Areogonum fasciculatum, the California buckwheat. Um, the San Francisco chapter of CNPS asks people to choose the coast buckwheat, Areogonum latifolium, and the naked wild buckwheat, Areogonum nudum, variety nudum. And I don't know how it got that common name because it's not naked, but it is wild um, for their indigenous butterfly population. So San Francisco people, please take note. Calscape lists 261 species of Areogonums. So you can get very hyper local and get the one that's practically native to your own backyard. So people might have heard of buckwheat pancakes or buckwheat soba noodles. They are actually the seeds of this flowering plant ground into a gluten-free flour. So it's a people food and an insect food and a bird food. Sheds the leaves making this nice duff. It's nice own mulch and has a long flowering season. It is also considered a keystone species meaning it supports lots of different species of insects. Doesn't have an obligate relationship with just one, like say the swallowtail butterfly or the monarch. September cannot go wrong with the epilobium, which used to be called Zauschneria. So I have deemed it whatever area. But the common name is California fuchsia, epilobium canum. There's different varieties. Some are a little smaller than others. And it's a funny plant. So I planted one next to a rock in my garden and it decided to set out a rudder, runner and have another clone 20 feet away. Figure, okay, that's where it wants to be. That's where it's happy, let it go. Um, so the hummingbirds really like this um, plant in the fall and it is covered in flowers. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, when all the flowers are, gone and um, it's done flowering. You can actually trim it pretty close to the ground, um, two to six inches, and then it will bunch out um, and be very dense the next year. If you don't trim it to the ground, the new growth comes off the old growth and gets a little top heavy because it has so many flowers and flops over. So do give it a haircut. It's going to appreciate that. 
October, I'm cheating a bit because I'm crediting it to pumpkins, even though the pumpkin flowers were earlier in the season. But it, this is for a concept, learning a concept about monoecious plants, one plant with separate kinds of flowers. So the first flower diagram had the stamens and the pistils, the pollen and the ova in the same flower, whereas squashes and pumpkins have them in separate flowers. So I was always curious how you could have stuff squash blossoms in the summer and still have a squash in the fall. And that's because you can pick most, but not all of the male flowers, the pollen producing flowers, and still have the fruit producing flowers. So here's a female flower because there's the growing squash. So one house, monoecious, the flowers are separate, um, male flowers and female flowers. And this photograph is actually of a native gourd since gourds are a new world plant and um, of a summer squash. So this would not be a plant that you would grow in your garden necessarily, but I wanted to bring attention to the extraordinary me measures that plants, uh, native plants go through to be totally doubt, drought tolerant, where they don't need any supplemental irrigation at all. So this is man root or the wild cucumber. So it has a wild cucumber looking fruit, lots of spikes. You can see a tendril going off a couple yards and go into the ground and have no idea that the root can weigh 200 pounds. This is someone excavated out the root of a single man root plant. And this big blobby thing is uh, a single root of a man root. The tendrils change directions midway and Darwin actually wrote a long paper about this. So just you know, sometimes the um, a plant that's not that extraordinary looking initially can have some really interesting aspects to it. November is my favorite, coyote brush. So remember there's monoecious plants where you can pick the male flowers for stuffed squash blossoms and still get squash in the fall. This is a dioecious plant where the male flowers and the female flowers, I know all the botanists are cringing because you're not supposed to, you're supposed to say staminate and pistillate, but whatever, are on separate plants. So you have total boy plants and total girl plants. So the staminate flowers are gonna make pollen and the pistillate um, flowers are going to mature to a seed and the seed has these filaments on it for seed dispersal so they can fly away like a daffodil or a um, dandelion. And the plant, when it's covered with mature seeds, look like a shaggy coyote, hence the name, the common name, coyote brush. Um, so it's fall flowering. It's in the Asteraceae family, just like a chrysanthemum or an aster, which are other fall flowering plants. So it provides nectar and pollen in the fall when all the wildflowers are gone. So it's a very important plant for year round food production or food availability. Um, and if you look at um, Calflora, you can see that it is surviving in areas that have an average of three inches of rain per year. So here you have a totally green, healthy looking plant with all these non-native European weeds that are just dry as a bone. And the plant's like, fine, I can deal with it. So coyote brush are neat. It took me a little while to find a flowering plant that flowers reliably in December, but I found one. And that's the beautiful tree, the coast silk tassel, Garia elliptica. It's also dioecious um, and the staminate uh, flowers, the um, flowers that produce pollen, have these long tendrils, these long catkins that can be 15 inches long draping down. And they would just wiggle with the slightest breeze and disperse their pollen to the um, uh, plants, the female plants that with the pistillate flowers. Um, so it attracts lots of beneficial insect, insects, supports bees. It's very dense, so it's a very good bird habitat. I'm providing good shelter and the female plants uh, do ripen to seeds and fruit that birds love. So the oak tree 
doesn't need pollination. It's wind pollination, wind pollinated. It's also monoecious. It has the um, catkins that have the produce the pollen and obviously the flowers that mature into an acorn, but it provides habitat for hundreds of species, different species of insects. And the caterpillars are gonna munch the leaves and they're not going to pupate necessarily where they are munching the leaves because birds can eat them. They can't move around when they're in the, in the chrysalis. So they're gonna to drop to the ground, hide in this underbrush that you have provided for them and then um, fly away as a butterfly or a, or a moth. So don't put your oak trees in a lawn where you're gonna walk and where you're gonna mow. Leave it in an area with some understory plants. So um, hazelnuts, huckleberries, I've got Douglas iris here, coffee berries, uh, Western stored sword fern, Festuca californica is a beautiful grass that grows under oaks, it's gorgeous. Um, native ribes, gooseberries, which can be deciduous or evergreen, and that cute deciduous shrub, the snowberry. Um, they're behind the Mill Valley Library. You can see them, the shiny white berries in, the, in December. They're just very, very good looking plants. So, um, and no footsteps, just stay out from under your oak tree because you'll be squishing all the insects that have used that oak tree for food. Another understory option, which is a little flashier, would be the hookura. I just love hookuras or alum root. I actually don't know how they got that common name, alum root. Um, but the rosette of leaves stay low. The flowers are airy and above them. It's a unique plant or a relatively unique plant because it grows in dry shade. A lot of shade loving plants require a lot of moisture. This one is very drought tolerant. And there are hybrids, non-natives necessarily, but hybrids that can be extremely flashy in the garden because the leaf color can extend from chartreuse, absolute bright yellow chartreuse to a dark burgundy. So here's the Hucra maxima down in Southern California. And we've got Hucra micrantha as our local native. There's a lot of different Hucras. So I've got Douglas iris under my oak, and this is to show what flowers do to talk to their pollinators, um, to pay them for the work of transporting the pollen um, to the stigma. So here you've got a signal patch um, saying, come this way, which is sort of like uh, that green double-tailed uh, mermaid on the freeway where you stop for your third latte. So icons are, um, old for flowers and new for us. And it's got this tight little wedge here with the, um, the anther underneath. So when the butterfly or the uh, bumblebee crawls in, it's obliged to slide against the anther and pick up all the pollen and send it to the next, next plant. So a lot of engineering for maximal pollen transfer. Um, Las Pilitas Nursery does have a really good list of understory plants for under your oak tree. And who would not want this beautiful Douglas iris under your oak tree? I don't know why people get bearded irises. It's like they can't shave. So it's a wrap. Um, you can think of your house as a very straight sided Mount Tam for those in Marin or a very straight sided Mount Diablo for the East Bay guys. So you've got a north face, which is gonna be shady, a south face, which is gonna be very sunny, east face with morning sun and west face with afternoon sun. And so you can try plants in different appropriate locations, find the one that's really thriving and plant more of them, and then retry the ones or move the ones that are not completely happy. This is just a little look at the start of my spreadsheet to show you what a plant geek I am. So when I plant a plant, I tend to record the genus, species, variety, cultivar, rootstock, common name, family name, where I got it from and where it is in the garden and special notes about it. So I'm not quite up to 200 yet, but I'm getting there. Um, so it's a, it's a fun way to revisit the names and, and get the spelling almost right. 
So winter, think Arctostaphylos, Ceanothus garia, spring, fruit trees, annual wildflowers, summer, salvias, buckwheats, fall, epilobium, um, canum, and the coyote brush, and native asters. Year round, our keystone support species are going to be the oaks, our native willows, and Prunus alyssifolia as another example. You can have broad support, that would be a keystone species, or you can have narrow support, like the milkweeds for the monarchs, or the um, pipevine for the swallowtails. And you can find out more. Um, I was going to talk about Calscape and Calflora as sites that are fun to explore. Calflora is a compendium of all plants found wild in California. So that would be our 6,000 plus native species and unfortunately including all the ones that were brought here either accidentally or on purpose, but have escaped the garden and are now can live independently, live wild, like a feral pig sort of. Um, but they're for the citizen scientists, if you're hiking around and find a plant and can identify it, you can add a data point for Calflora. Calscape is oriented towards gardeners and um, has wonderful information about plants that are appropriate to your location, including putting in your address and finding plants that would be appropriate where you live and divided to annuals, trees, vines, etc. So really wonderful sites to explore with the others. So this um, slide is available on the slope website as well. So that's what I came to say this morning. So open up to questions if some appeared on the Q&A. Yes, this is, wow, what a really cool presentation of this information. There's several of us that feel that your uh, slides would be a really cool calendar. So <laughs> I do, I do want to remind everyone that her, her slides are available on Sloat's website. Um, and you should have received a link to that in your reminder email before the class. Once the recording is available on Tuesday, that slide presentation will be right underneath it. So um, that'll be a really good resource. And what's fun about the recordings is that you can go through and rewind and screenshot and whatnot. And so it's a really valuable source of information. Um, we do have some questions. Um, First of all, some people are wondering if you allow visitors to your farm because it sounds really amazing. <laughs> uh, and then can you use bunch grass in an area where you need to walk? Um, do they get out of hand? Do weeds grow easily between or among them? So yeah, bunch grasses, um, a turf forming grass will set out rhizomes or stolons sideways and have a node with the roots going down and the, and the blades coming up. So that would be your um, golf course, or if you're in the Midwest, they actually made houses um, out of sod, cutting it and flipping it upside down and stacking it. Whereas the bunch grass um, is more accommodating to an arid location like California, uh, where the, the bunch of grass would be more isolated. So it could gather water from a larger area. Um, and so because there's open ground in between it, it will allow for weeds to come in. So it does benefit from weeding. Um, if you leave it completely alone, the European non-native weeds will probably take over. They get a little jump start in the winter um, and grow more quickly, um, but then they're dead in June. So they're not really good year round. When uh, John Muir came to California, the bunch grasses were green in August and September. So the golden hills of California are the non-native grasses and our grasses would stick it out through the year. So I think it's worth weeding around them. Um, there, because there's 300 species, there's some that are very small and there's some that are three feet tall. So get a species again, just like your shrubs um, that is appropriate for your, your location. They will tolerate uh, walking around on. Um, so they can be used. I mean, if you have a rock pathway 
um, they can go around it or you can use it in open air. I mean, my dog runs around on our bunch grass meadow all the time and where he typically runs, there's <laughs> a little more wear and tear, but they're very tolerant to, um, to walking on and then allows for the bees and allows for the, um, for the wildflowers. So you have a meadow, which is just gonna be a lot more delightful to look at than a you know, green carpet. I mean, to my mind, you know how um, sometimes corporations can cultivate a taste for something like a diamond ring is for you know, engagement. Well, in the 60s, they, uh, agrochemistry, a uh, chemical industry developed a selective herbicide so grasses are monocots and a lot of the flowering plants are the dicots like daisies and stuff like that. And so if you can kill the dicots and leave the monocots alone, you can have a quote unquote green grass lawn without any other plants in it. But, and so they cultivated that as the ultimate sign of wonderful home ownership, which really is putting poison on your lawn. So um, we wanna cultivate a wild aesthetic a diverse, in my opinion, a diverse aesthetic. So I like bunch grasses and I like things growing in between them. But yeah, do get out the European weeds. They'll take, they will take over. Um, actually, that makes me think, I have a question because I've been using, just as a designer, I've been using the native, you can, we can order native sod, yes. which can be a really cool uh, sub for replacing your traditional lawns. And so, um, that's something to consider. The native sod blends do have the bunch grasses in them and they're way more drought tolerant once they're established, but they still give you that, that green blob or that lawn patch that sometimes you just can't find from any other plant. Um, and so you can still do that sort of, I guess, more responsibly, have, have a more responsible lawn. So anyway. Um, Question about native succulents. Is there value um, with pollinators? And if so, which ones? So um, actually there's a Dudleya Protection Act um, that's, I don't know if it's passed yet, but there's been w irresponsible wild collection of um, native succulents. So if you are, going to get a native succulent, make sure it's from a nursery that and it's been seed grown and it's been not poached from, from the wild. Um, but they are extraordinarily resilient plants. And when I had some Dudleya formosa in a sort of brick um, planter up to my front door and they were growing and I saw a little baby Dudleya literally growing between two bricks. I mean, there was no soil, you know? And when, if you're hiking to, um, to the lighthouse near Golden Gate, the bridge, I mean, you'll see a, a, a rock face. That's just a vertical rock face that's been cut for the trail. And you'll see Dudley is on a vertical rock face. I mean, they're just amazing. They're yeah. fabulous. Um, long flowering, uh, tract pollinators, um, already beautiful just buy them responsibly. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit about small space fog belt plants? What you'd recommend? So uh, Sausalito down to San Francisco. Um, actually, I didn't mention it, but it's Scrofularia Californica, the uh, California bee plant. Um, really, really likes fog, has maroon colored flowers, bicolored flowers, um, which are very, very attractive um, and um, will, will not grow anywhere else. It's like, no, it has to grow in, in the fog. Um, and the, um, I would go to Calscape um, because there you can search for plants uh, by criterion. Um, so the size of the plant, the flowering season and the environment. So I'm not sure if they have fog specifically, um, but yeah, let me look for that. But they, they basically can cut it almost any way you can imagine and then end up with plant suggestions. So calscape.org would be where I'd look. 
Great. Um, what, uh, okay. How, if, when you're purchasing plants, how can you tell if you're buying a male or female? You need to have both in your yard for native plants. Okay. So that only goes for dioecious plants. So if a plant, uh, if a flower has all sexual parts, it's, um, it doesn't have, um, a gender associated with it. If it's monish, just like an oak, um, both types of flowers are on the same plant. So it's just a tiny minority of dioecious plants, coyote brush and the Gary elliptica. Um, so generally in the nursery trade, they're gonna sell the male coyote brush. So that's gonna look like a normal plant all year round with small flowers. And it won't look like a white shaggy coyote in the fall, which personally I like. So in order to get both a male and a female, um, you might have some coyote brush wild on your property or on your neighbor's property, you can collect seeds. I don't re remove plants from the wild, but if a seed happens to fall in my pocket, well, that's just an accident, right? Um, and maybe specialty um, native plant sales would have male and female coyote brush. Um, also the Gary elliptica, the silk tassel, again, the males have the long, you know, it's like a peacock, they're flashier. They have the longer um, uh, catkins with the uh, longer flowers and uh, the females are not typically in the trade, but it would be marked as a female. Um, kiwi farmers, although we didn't, are also dioecious. So a kiwi farmer will plant five females, one male, five females, one male, in order to get them all pollinated and not waste a lot of ground on a, a plant that won't produce, um, produce fruit. So if you are, have a dioecious plant specifically for a crop, they would clearly label it as male and female because you want to get the right ratio. That makes sense. Um, several people are asking what plants are available at Sloat that you talked about. And I do want to remind you that each of the locations has a different um, uh, sort of inventory. And so uh, we have a decent amount of native plants at each location, just not necessarily the same plants at each location. So and you more know, appropriate for that location. Yeah, right, exactly. And um so visit your, your nearest slope to see what we have in stock for you. And we can also try to order stuff that we don't have in stock. Um, a few people are asking about the hummingbird sage. And I think for some reason, I've been seeing this on other sites that hummingbird sage, one has is gotten a lot of buzz lately for good reason, because it's amazing. And two, it hasn't been super available. Mm. So that's probably a combination of the popularity. Um, but anyway, yeah, we will get it in if, if and when it is available. And it is an incredible plant. I actually, I have that in my garden too. And I didn't realize how much it spreads out and how much the hummingbirds really do love it. It's <laughs> such a perfect name. Um, so this has been an amazing presentation. I have learned so much and I'm so thankful for everything that you shared. I do want to remind everyone again that the recording will be available on Tuesday as well as um, the, the link to the slides that Joan shared. And so that's a really good resource to go back and look over everything and remind yourself of the different plants and um, uh, different things that Joan shared. Also, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me. Both Joan and I are available to help support your native plant journey and support attracting native pollinators. And so we really encourage you, if you do have questions, to follow up and we will try to answer them as much as possible. Um, I think the sun might be starting to peek through a little bit. I'm going to try to go on a hike this afternoon. Everybody get out and enjoy the outdoors before it rains, hopefully tomorrow. And I really am grateful for you to uh, join us today. Have a great rest of your Saturday. Thanks so much, Joan, for your expertise and your information. It's been really valuable and enjoyable. So thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. That was a gas. Yes.